Ecclesiastes chapter 7 tonight, if you'll find it, back in our Ecclesiastes series, trying to cover a chapter a night. No way to do it. No possible way to do it with chapter 7. So we'll try to cover it in two weeks, but Ecclesiastes chapter 7. And I, I'm, I, I have two Bibles in my office that I work through all the time, um, reading Bible, study Bible, back and forth. And I have a Bible that I always preach out of. And I made the mistake when I left the office from the house uh, this afternoon that I stuck my notes in the wrong Bible. And so I don't have my Bible that I normally preach out of. And the difference is, is that the print is a lot smaller in this one. I would get glasses, but that would be an admitting that I'm old. And so I refuse to do that. Um, I, I had glasses at one time. I had to get glasses one time. And my eyes corrected themselves, so I didn't need the glasses any longer. But, but if I can't see a verse, I may have to have somebody read it for me. Uh, that'd be better than admitting that you're getting old. Uh, in, in my prideful estimation, but Ecclesiastes chapter 7. One of the difficulties of Ecclesiastes is that a lot of it sounds like a carnal man talking. And the reason for that is that a lot of it is a carnal man talking. We're used to books like writers like David and Paul and, and majestic language. And everything that they wrote was deeply spiritual. And so we expect all of the Bible to be like that. There's a lot of statements in Ecclesiastes that are just, they just sound carnal. And the reason why is because Solomon has spent 15 years in the world. And you can't be in the world that long without getting a lot of carnal thoughts and a lot of carnal philosophies in your mind. And so the book is written from the perspective of a man who experienced the world, realized the folly of it, and writes to warn you, don't follow that same path. Now for me, as I study the book of Ecclesiastes, the first half of the book is more difficult than the second half of the book. Now the reason for that, now this is very wise, the reason for that is because the first half of the book is what I've covered thus far. I haven't covered the second half of the book. It is a book where you have to admit at times, I'm not sure what that verse means. But any time that you say that, it's not a reflection on the Bible, it's a reflection on my understanding of the Bible. Doesn't mean the verse needs to be rewritten. It means I need to reread it and just reread it and just reread it. Now, there, there's, a, there's a statement that's, that's going to be found in Ecclesiastes 7. We're going to read it a number of times. Something is better than, better than, better than. Back in chapter 4, we, we found that phrase. In fact, just back up to chapter 4. And, and we found that word better four times. And I preached from chapter 4 on some things that are better. Look at chapter 4 and verse number 1. So I returned and considered all the oppressions that are done under the sun. And behold, the tears of such as were oppressed. And here's the key phrase. And they had no comforter. So we said it's better to lean on a comforter. If you have to go through this oppressive world, boy, it's good to have somebody to lean on. We do, Holy Ghost, that's our comforter. Right. Then in verse number six, he says, better is a handful with quietness than both the hands full with travail and vexation of spirit. So we said in verse six, it's better to live with contentment. In verse number nine, Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labors. Better to labor with a companion. Verse 13, better is a poor and a wise child than an old and foolish king who will no more be admonished. So it's better to lead with a childlike spirit. So, so I preached in chapter 4 on some things that are better. When you get to chapter 7, he's going to, he's going to start naming some more things that are better. So here's what I have titled this message. And I, I, I thought long and hard about this. And I think this is very clever. More things that are better. Because that's what he gives us. He gives us more things that are better. Look at verse 1. 
A good name is better than precious ointment. And the day of death than the day of one's birth. I heard you say right on that first one. You didn't say right on that second one. <laughs> Verse 2. It is better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. <laughs> For that is the end of all men, and the living will lead to his heart. Sorrow is better than laughter. For by the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. The heart of the wise is in the house of mourning, but the heart of fools is in the house of mirth. It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool, this also is vanity. Surely oppression maketh a wise man mad, and a gift destroyeth the heart. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. So it gives us a number of things that are better. But boy, they sure do strike against our way of thinking, don't they? I got an amen out of verse 1. I didn't get any amens out of the rest of the chapter. These, this is, now, now, these proverbs that he's given us on better things is really in answer to a question that he posed at the end of chapter 6. Come back to chapter 6 and look at verse number 12. For who knoweth what is good for man in this life? All the days of his vain life, which he spendeth as a shadow. For who can tell a man what shall be after him under the sun? There is so much uncertainty about life. There is so much unsettledness about life. People all the time think that something is good turns out to be bad. You spend a lot of time correcting mistakes that you made in your youth. So Solomon asked the rhetorical question, who knoweth? How do you know what's good and bad and, 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 and what, what comes after it? Who knows? So, so now in chapter 7, he's going to answer that question. I'll tell you what's good. I, I'll tell you what's good in life. And so he gives us seven things that are better. Let's run through them. Number one, in verse number one, character is better than reputation. Look at verse one. A good name is better than precious ointment. Now the word better, the word better is a comparison word. It means we're going to set two things side by side. We're going to compare them, apples with apples, and we're going to decide which one is better. I, I, I heard, I I was bringing Parker to work this morning. Uh, Parker's working in the print shop part-time. Dathan is working in the print shop. Uh, Joseph is working in the print shop and, and, uh, for, for the summer. And, and I heard about a little debate that is going on in the print shop. Brother Al has them testing. You know when you have a Twix candy bar and it's got two? The left and the right. He has them trying to determine what's the difference between the left one and the right one. A am I telling you the truth? Am I the truth? Okay. This, this is the level. <laughs> anyway. But the word better, sometimes the word better is subjective. Sometimes the word better is objective. Now what do I mean? If I were to say that gold is better than aluminum, nobody would object to that. If you did, you would be wrong. That is an objective truth, right? If I were to say that Zaxby's is better than Moe's, it is, but you might not agree with that, all right? That's subject to your opinion. That is a subjective opinion. Depends on what your references are what your preference is. But, 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 but these are objective truths. This is not subject to what you think. He says a good name is better. Now he's not talking about the name that you were given at your birth. I'm not talking about John or Jerry or whatever, but it's the name that you've given yourself over years of living. Your name is your character. It's your reputation. It is your 
testimony. It's what you are known for. Your name is what you are. A good name is better. It's found two times in your Bible. Solomon said it both. The other time is in Proverbs 22 and verse 1. A good name is rather to be chosen than great riches and loving favor than silver and gold. You know that men used to take pride in their name? They wanted a good name as being hardworking and honest and dependable and generous and kind and, and all of that. And, and, and they, they were jealous of that. And, and now, it's, now it's common for a man to sell his name out for something cheap or some cheap deal or, or some, some cheap business dealings. But a man's name used to mean something for him. If you ever watched old westerns? And the guy comes into the saloon and calls the guy, calls the other cowboy a liar. Well, that, that's, that's a mark on your name. Those are fighting words. You call a man a liar. Well, the only way we're going to settle this is with a duel. We've got to go out to the streets. We've got to pace off. We're going to shoot this out. And if he doesn't, then he's a coward. He's yellow. You just... In the Westerns, you just didn't call a man a liar because that's a slander on his character. Now, now that sounds rather extreme, all right? It does. If, 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 if you call me a liar, I'm not going to shoot you, okay? <laughs> that, that, so that, that, that's a little bit. But, but listen, we don't estimate the value of a good name like, like old timers used to. At the end of the Civil War era, lotteries were outlawed in the United States. There had been lotteries, but they were so rife with corruption and, and, and notoriously crooked that lotteries were banned in every state. Louisiana was trying to get a law passed called the Louisiana Lottery to get the lottery legalized in Louisiana. It would be interstate, so you could come in and go out, but it was to be in Louisiana. And, and they finally got it passed. But there were so many bribes and paybacks and, and there was so much fraud in it that in 1890, Congress passed a law, again, banning lottery in the United States. And the lottery was illegal until 1964. And New Hampshire got the lottery ball rolling again. But when they were trying to get it passed in Louisiana way back in the 1800s, some men came to General Robert Lee E. Lee. Now, this is after the war. They come to General Robert E. Lee, great respected statesman, and they tried to get him to endorse it. And if you will endorse the law passing the Louisiana lottery, that'll give it a whole lot of weight. And, and, and they said, if you'll endorse the law, it will make you a very wealthy man. And they said that General Robert E. Lee stood up on his crutches and he said, gentlemen, I lost my home in the war I lost my fortune in the war. I lost everything except my name in the war. My name is not for sale. And if you don't get out of here, I'm going to beat you over the head with these crutches. <laughs> he valued his name. A good name is better. Now watch this. A good name is better than precious ointment. Now you need to read that in light of Bible culture. And I have read three interpretations of what it means by precious ointment. Two of them ring true. One of them I don't. I'll give you the two that rings true and you can decide. Interpretation number one. People in ancient days didn't bathe every day like hopefully you do. Okay? By the way, teenagers, I think bathing every day is a good thing. It's a good thing. Boy or girl. Boy or girl. Doesn't matter. Whether you need it or not, I just think it's a good thing. I just to sort of throw, throw that out there. They didn't bathe every day, so they would use perfumes. They would ointments to compensate in between bathing days, all right? And it could be that the precious ointment that he's talking about is, is, is the perfume that you would use to keep the smell down on the off days. It is used to cover something up. So this verse could be saying that, that it's better to have a good name that is true and, and it's real than to have to be covering up, making excuses like you would with, with, with this precious ointment. Some people, they're, they're very honest, they're very trustworthy. 
And there's other people, there's just a little whiff of something there. Something about them that just doesn't smell right. Huh? You know what I'm talking about? Huh? Better to have a good name, a good name, than to have to cover up your lack of character with a squirt of perfume or precious ointment. Now, that's one way that you could look at that, all right? Here's the second way, and I, I really think this is it. A good name is better than precious ointment. In Bible days, people don't, didn't always deal in hard currency. And sometimes, instead of gold and silver, ointments, precious ointments, were a way of, of keeping money without it actually being money. For example, Isaiah 39 and verse 2, Hezekiah was glad. He brings the Babylonians in to show them all the riches of the temple. Hezekiah was glad of them, showed them the house of his precious things. Well, what was in his house of precious things? The silver, the gold, the spices, and the precious ointment. Mark 14 and verse 3, being in Bethany in the house of Simon the leper, as he sat at meat, there came a woman having an alabaster box of ointment of spikenard, very precious. So precious ointments was something that you had that was valuable. And when Solomon says that a good name, that's what you are, it's better than precious ointment, that's what you have, then what you are is better than what you have. The world measures your worth by what you have, but everything that you have can easily be lost or destroyed or lose value, but not a good name. So what do you have? Big car? Big house? Um, big bank account? I'm not against any of those things. But what are you? What are you? What do you do when no one is around? How do you talk when you're with lost friends? What would you do if you knew you'd never get caught? Hmm? What private thoughts do you entertain? See, there's a big difference between what you have and who you are. Which one is more valuable to you? It is better that you are something good than that you have something. Proverbs 15 and verse 16. Better is little, that's what you have, with the fear of the Lord. Fearing God, that's who you are. Better is the little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. Proverbs 16 and verse 8. Better is a little, that's what you have, Better is little with righteousness, that's what you are, than great revenues without right. Proverbs 17 and verse 1. Better is a dry morsel and quietness therewith than a house full of sacrifices with strife. He's saying character is better. You know, I was thinking about this and I've got to move on. If you're just getting started in life, if you just got married or, or if you just graduated from college and you're just starting your life out, you're tempted to look at somebody that's 50 and what they have. You just got married, you, you just graduated from college, you're just starting your life out, and there's a tendency for you to want what your parents have. And the temptation is to run out and go get it all on credit cards and ruin the next 20 years of your life. That, that's the temptation. Chances are your parents didn't start out with everything that they had, what they have now. Chances are they started out with nothing, but, but here, here's the difference. They started out by being something first, and the stuff comes later as you build a life. They went to work, and they were honest, and they worked hard, and they saved a little bit of money, and they tried to be frugal. That's being something. That's having a good name. And now they have a good name, but they also have some precious ointment as well. Got, got some things, and, and if you will determine, I'm going to build a good life, I'm going to build a life of character, then that stuff will come in due time. Yes, Better to have character than reputation. Well, look at the second part of verse 2. Here's the second thing. Character is better than reputation. Secondly, funerals are better than birthdays. Look at verse 1. 
A good name is better than precious ointment, and the day of death than the day of one's birth. Now, how is that possible? How is it that the day that the day you die is better than the day that you're born? Two significant days. Here's the day that you come into the world. Here's the day that you leave the world. Now, Job. Job cursed the day that he was born. And Job said, I wish I had never seen the light of day. But that's a depressed, suicidal man that's talking. This is not what Solomon is saying. He's not saying that death is a better thing than birth. If that's true, there's nothing wrong with suicide. So that's not, that's not what he's saying. But how is the day of death better than the day of birth? People send celebrations, gifts when a baby is born. But they send flowers and condolences when somebody dies. But think about this. When that baby is born in this world, he's born into a troubled world. And nobody knows the sorrows and the pain and the disease and the betrayal that is ahead for that baby. But when that person dies, all those sorrows and troubles are behind him. Now, now I, I, I'm speaking from a human perspective. Setting aside heaven and hell, all right? Setting aside the joy, setting aside, setting aside that from just the viewpoint of life on earth, death is an escape from the troubles and the pains of this world. Furthermore, you have no control over the day that you were born. You do have some control over how you die. You had no say into the home that you were born, right? You do have some say as to the kind of home that you make. You have no control over a single detail of your birth, but you get to go out and you get to build a life and some say in the kind of death that you die. You can die the death of a wicked man or you can die the death of a righteous man. You can die cursed of God or you can die blessed of God. You can die having lived for God or you could die having wasted your life in vanity. Yeah. I, tell you, I, tell you, I tell you a man that really took this phrase to heart. His name was Paul. Here's what Paul said. For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Really? Yeah. He said, if I live in the flesh, this is the fruit of my labor, yet what I shall choose, I what not. Boy, I, I, I really can't tell. He said, I'm in a straight betwixt two. Now watch this. Having a desire to depart and to be with Christ, which is far better. When you put it in the context of Christianity, it will be a better day for you when you die and go to heaven than it was the day that you were born. He says the day of death. It's not saying, it's not saying, it's not saying, it's not a morbid thought. It's not a suicidal thought. It's not, it's not a death wish. No, but looking at life from a perspective, I tell you that the, that the worst thing that can happen to you is one day you're going to die and go to heaven and live as long as God does. Huh? Yeah. Give you a little interesting side note right here. Just, just a little side note. We make a big deal out of birthdays. But you know the Bible doesn't make a big deal out of birthdays. In fact, the word birthday only shows up two times in your Bible. They celebrated two birthdays in the Bible. One of them was in Genesis chapter 4, Pharaoh. Pharaoh celebrated his birthday. And the way he celebrated it was having the baker that was in prison having him killed. The second birthday is in Mark 14, Herod. Celebrated by having Salome come and dance and had John the Baptist beheaded. That's the two birthday celebrations in the Bible. Yeah. I don't know whose birthday's coming up next, but I just want you to think about that. <laughs> the Jehovah's Witnesses take that then, and that becomes one of their reasons for not celebrating birthdays. I think it's really hard to stretch to make that connection, but the Bible does make more of the death of a man than the birth of a man. Precious in the sight of the Lord is the death of one of his saints. We're never told to celebrate the birth of Christ. We are told to celebrate the death and the resurrection of Christ. 
Funerals better than birthdays. Here's the third thing. In verse number two, sadness is better than gladness. Look at verse two. Are we okay tonight? Okay tonight? I'm trying to hurry. I really am. It's better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men, and the living will lay it to his heart. Now, none of us would rather go to a funeral over a party. Solomon said it is more profitable to grieve than to feast. The house, the house of feasting and mirth, it will never help you spiritually. It's fun, but you don't get any help there. But when you go to the house of mourning and you sit there and you start thinking about life and death and immortality and where you are and how much time you have left and what you need to change before because one day you're going to die too. You know, I have never, I'm, I'm sure it's happened, I've never seen somebody get saved at a wedding. I've heard the preacher get up and preach the gospel, but I've never seen anybody get saved. Maybe there was. But you know, there's been a number of times that a preacher stood at a funeral and preached and many people got saved at a funeral. You're in a more serious, somber mood and it makes you think. Somebody wrote this, the benefits of a funeral. You understand more clearly the ultimate result of the fall. It gives you proper consideration to the brevity of life. It reminds us that how we live does count. It prompts us to recommit to life, our lives, in light of eternity. It makes you want to be prepared to die. It teaches us the value of comfort and of being comforted. It impresses us that no one lives to himself and no one dies to himself. So Solomon says that more is accomplished in our sorrows than in our laughter. You know, t TV has, has these shows that are called sitcom, situation comedy. Comedy that is supposed to be taken from life situations. Every sitcom that is on TV, number one, it's not real life situation. You don't live like that. And the comedy is not funny. Late night comedians are not funny. They're filthy. They're raunchy is what they are. But the world wants to laugh their sorrows away. They want to entertain their life away. And a culture that is built on laughter and entertainment is a silly, non-serious society. He says in verse 2, he says, um, it's better to go to the house of mourning than to go to the house of feasting. For that is the end of all men and the living will lay it to his heart. When you go to a funeral, you take it to heart. You let it sink in. You can't learn anything as all you do is laugh and tell dirty jokes and watch TV. You don't learn anything that way. Nothing wrong, nothing wrong with laughing. Nothing wrong with having a good time. I, I've never been to a comedy club. I, I, I've never been to one. I, I think that would be a very ungodly environment for a Christian to go to. With the bar and the alcohol and the drunks and the dirty jokes. So, so I, I, wouldn't, I, I, I can't imagine that a member of Victory Baptist Church would go to a bar and to a comedy club. I can't imagine that would happen. But just in case, just in case, you are in a very unchristian. It's about as a Christian as a movie theater, all right? I'm preaching, I feel like I'm preaching to myself, and that's okay. I, I'm okay with that. Good, clean, Christian laughter is a good thing, but you'll never learn anything about life. You'll never be made serious to think seriously about the future if you want to live in the house of mirth. Sadness is better than gladness, he says. In fact, he says in verse number three, sorrow is better than laughter. For by the sadness of the heart, of the countenance, is the, the heart is made wiser. No, no, think about that. By the sadness of the countenance, the heart is made better. How is that so? Did you know that sadness will make you want to change and improve your life? 
Gladness will never make you want to change anything. Right? If you go to the doctor and the doctor says, you know what, you're in good shape. You'll be pretty glad, won't you? And you won't think you need to change anything. But if you go to the doctor and it says, look, you got high blood pressure and you're borderline diabetic and you're overweight, you're going to leave thinking, I don't like him. What a rude doctor. But you know, I might want to lose some weight. You know, I might, I might want to change my diet. I might want to exercise a little bit. If he makes you glad, you're not changing anything. If he makes you sad, you know that you're going to need to make some changes. Sermons that just make you glad are good, but they don't last very long. But every once in a while, a sermon needs to make you sad. Every once in a while, a sermon ought to make you mad, ought to step on your toes, ought to offend you, ought to make you leave. Don't like that preacher. But he was right. I, I do need to change. I should be, I should. You see, conviction of sin brings sorrow and sorrow brings repentance and repentance brings change. That doesn't happen with laughter. Sadness, better than glass. I gotta hurry, I gotta hurry. Look at verse number five. Rebuke is better than flattery. Look at verse five. It is better to hear the rebuke of the wise than for a man to hear the song of fools. If you had a friend that said, look, I'm going to tell you straight, you're a mess. You really need to get it together. Amen. Right? That's better than if you have somebody that's buttering you up and feeding you flattery because he wants something out of you. Right? Let me put it on the, let me put it on the level so the front row can understand this. Right? <clears throat> if you had a booger in your nose... Would you want me to tell you? Or would you want me just that you walk around in front of all the girls with a booger hanging out of your nose? It might would embarrass you, right? But I'd be your friend if I told you, hey, look, man, you need it. You need it. You know, take care of it. It's better. It is better. It is better for you to be rebuked. God to counsel. Be rebuked than, than flattery. Yes. Proverbs 26 and 7 and verse 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Right, right. Yes, Nobody likes rebuke, including myself. Right? A man does not want to be told that he is wrong. Right? The only thing, Delancey, worse than a man being told that he's wrong is for a woman to tell him that he's wrong. Yeah. But, but worse than that, when it's his woman that tells him that he's wrong. Every man knows what I'm talking about, right? The, the rebuke could be a preacher, it could be a teacher, it could be a parent, it could be a, po, a co-worker. But one, listen, one hour of rebukeful preaching is better than 10 hours of TV. When I walk, when I walk, when I walk, I, I listen to preaching. I get maybe one or two hours of good preaching in every day. That's more valuable to me than if I sit down and watch, watch news all day long. A rebuke is less appealing than a song. I'd rather somebody sing to me than rebuke me. But a wise counselor will profit more than a flatterer. Everybody wants to be right. Nobody likes to be corrected even when they're wrong. And sometimes when confronted with what they're wrong, they'll laugh and they'll try to make a joke out of it. And that's a way to deflect because that's more comfortable. Better to be rebuked than to be flattered. And if you want to improve your life, you will have no problem with somebody correcting you in kindness and in love. An enemy notices your mistakes and gossips about them. A friend notices your mistakes and helps you correct them. He says in verse 6, For as the crackling of thorns under a pot, so is the laughter of the fool. This also is vanity. Boy, to sit by a fire at night and listen to the crackling of the fire. And it's so soothing and it's so tranquil. There is something about just watching a fire that just lets your mind get away. But thorns are like 
kindling gives off warmth for a minute, but it's not going to last. The fire is not going to last. The heat is temporary, and the laughter of a fool is short-lived. You will be embarrassed when somebody rebukes you, but the embarrassment is short-lived when you acknowledge the problem and you fix it. He says in verse 7, Surely oppression maketh a wise man mad, and the gift destroyeth the heart. Oppression, if you dwell on your troubles, it'll make you mad. It'll go crazy. If all that you think is that life is not fair, that shouldn't happen to me, my life ought to be better than what it is, and the only way to go through the troubles of life without getting mad is to remember God. When I, was in, when I was in Bible college, there was a preacher that would come by and would preach. And um, his name was Bill Rice, Bill and Kathy Rice. Bill and Kathy Rice had a daughter. She was deaf. Boy, that's sorrow. It's not right. And they could have got mad at God. They could have got bitter at God. But you know what they did? They started a camp, a deaf camp. Thousands of young people have gone through it because... God let that daughter be born deaf. I know a preacher, he's been here before. His name is John Green. John and Tina Green were from Pensacola. They got married. He was driving a bread truck in Pensacola. They'd only been married a few weeks, maybe a few months, less than a year. And she was riding with him, going down one of the interstates in Pensacola, and somebody stopped in front of them. Suddenly he had to put the brakes on, and all those bread trays slammed to the front and pinned her and by the time they got her out, she's paralyzed. Paralyzed from a waist down, confined to a wheelchair. And John Green had to come to the police. He said, I heard his testimony. He said, I used to take that wheelchair. He, just, he said, I'd take that wheelchair. And I would throw it and I'd beat on it. And finally, God got me to the point where I had to get on my knees and I had to hug that wheelchair and thank God for it. They traveled for years around the world in evangelism, helping with the local church Bible publishers, doing a great work. You got to see God in it. There was a little girl that was born having trouble with her eyes, and the doctor messed up, and at six months old, the doctor put the wrong medicine in her eyes and blinded her for the rest of her life. But Fanny Crosby wrote over 8,000 hymns. There's people tonight with heavier burdens than you, but with more joy than you because they haven't forgotten God. Sadness better than gladness. Rebuke better than I'll just mention these quickly, just quickly. Verse number eight, finishing is better than starting. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning. Thereof. Better to finish a job than to start it and leave it. Better to keep a promise than to make a promise and walk away. Better to see the task through, to keep at it until you're done. If you're the kind of person that's always starting but you're never finishing, you get a reputation for being not dependable. I, I copied this from another sermon, from another sermon, but it was one of mine. If character opens something, character will close it. If character turns it on, character will turn it off. If character unlocks it, character will lock it back up. If character breaks it, character will admit it. If character can't fix it, character will call someone who can. If character borrows something, character will return it. If character makes a mess, character will clean it up. If character moves something, character will put it back. If character doesn't know how to operate it, character will leave it alone. It's really good, isn't it? Finishing, better start. Here's the last one. You can just... Make your own application. Patience is better than pride. Look at verse number 8. Better is the end of a thing than the beginning thereof. And the patient in spirit is better than the proud in spirit. Be not hasty in thy spirit to be angry. For anger resteth in the bosom of fools. There's two words of advice about anger. One of them is don't be too quick to anger. And the other is don't be too long in anger. Don't, don't hold on to it. Be slow to anger, be quick to forgive, and let things go. Heard a preacher say one time, if I called his name, some of you would know him. Heard a preacher say that anger is always a sin. I don't believe that. I think that sometimes it's a sin not to be angry. 
I think if you hear about a child rape, it's such a good thing to get angry over. You can tell a lot about a person by what it takes to make him mad. That's a good barometer of your character. Runaway, explosive danger can cause great damage to a relationship. So anger has to be kept under control. Never use this as a last resort. Never use as a bullying tactic. It's reserved only for very serious offenses, not trivial matters. But if you're patient, then you won't be quick to anger. If you're understanding and forgiving and lenient, treating people the way that you want to be treated. But when you are full of pride, that's when you abuse people. That's when you treat every offense as a major offense. That's when you're quick to blow up. And here's what he says about anger. Y'all get ready to sing his closing hymn. He says, he says in verse 9, For anger resteth in the bosom of fools. You know what a fool does? He lets that anger rest in his heart. It just stays there. And it festers and it grows. And when you let anger be at home in your heart, then it turns into bitterness and it spreads. You give anger just one little room in your heart, anger is going to go to another room. And anger is going to go to another room. And it's like giving him a bed in your house and telling him, just make yourself comfortable. It is better, it is better to be patient with offenses than getting angry. And when you do get angry, get rid of it. Don't let anger rest in your bosom. I have one more. I don't have time for it. You can just write it down. It's number seven. It's in verse number 10. Living for today is better than living in the past. Say not thou, what is the cause that the former days were better than the don't, don't say that. For thou dost not inquire wisely concerning this. Don't say the former days were so much better. That's not a wise thing. Reminiscing is fine. Live in the present. Take the day that God has given you. Don't be paralyzed by the past. Don't be hypnotized by tomorrow. Live in the present. Take the day that God's given you. Live as far. I'm out of time. Let's stand together. I'm done.